All right, all right, Rad Nation. Today we're going to be talking about dual energy or spectral CT, how it works, what's the motivation for doing it, and some example images that we have from dual energy CT. A CT image is just a map of the attenuation coefficient, right? So if a beam of X-rays is incident on a given material, then fewer X-rays are going to end up passing through that material than are incident. If there is a relatively small amount of attenuation, remember attenuation happens due to photoelectric and Compton scattering. And in either cases, we call those X-rays attenuated. If they interacted either via photoelectric or Compton, those two components add up to our attenuation. And if there's relatively small amount of attenuation, we say there is a small linear attenuation. If there is a relatively large attenuation rate, we say, there is a large attenuation coefficient. The way that we quantify the rate at which the x-rays stop in the material and those attenuation coefficients, if we just make a map of those attenuation coefficients, that is our CT image. Does an HU uniquely describe materials in the body? Actually, the answer is no. The Hounsfield unit does not uniquely describe materials in the body. The Hounsfield unit has a term due to that what we call the mass attenuation coefficient and a term due to the density. So the density and the mass attenuation coefficients actually can vary separately. So if you talk about one material such as iodine, you can actually have different concentrations of iodine and that can actually change the X-ray attenuation coefficient even though it's the same material. So for that reason, depending on the concentration of the given material, you might have overlap between the Hounsfield unit numbers. Two things that can occur in the body, calcium and iodine, they can occur in the vessels very close to one another when we're doing a contrast enhanced exam, especially if there's plaque, hard plaque can be calcified. And so you can have calcium and iodine in close proximity to one another. And we have a little hand, and in that hand, we have two given objects. One of them's calcium, and one of them's iodine. So if you look at this MIP, see our video on MIPS if you're not quite sure what a MIP is, but basically what we're doing is we're looking into the plane a little bit here. And if you look at this MIP, we've got our hand sitting here, and then there's two objects sitting here. These two cylinders, they have pretty similar attenuation actually at the 140 kVp. One of them is a simulation of iodine, and one of them is a simulation of calcium. On the other hand, if we go to 80 kVp, so a much lower energy spectra, now you can see that one of them is really showing up brightly. And which one do you think that would be? It's actually the iodine, right? Iodine, because it's a higher Z, is going to have a higher proportion of photoelectric at those low energies, so it's going to get bright faster. That is the calcium and that is the iodine. So that's a picture. If we got our hand on the scanner, that's kind of a slice right on top of our hand and through a little bit of the hand. If we look at the axial slice, it's those objects are gonna look like circles in the axial slice. Altitude units are not enough. So one acquisition with a polyenergetic X-ray beam, like we have on our X-ray tubes, is not enough to tell the given materials apart. But if we took two given acquisitions, could we tell these materials apart? As long as the noise is relatively controlled, the answer is yes. If you look at these acquisitions of iodine, and if you look at the acquisitions of calcium, you can see that there is actually some space in between them. When we plot on the 80 kVp on one axis and 140 kVp on another axis, we can appreciate that there is actually some space between the calcium and the iodine. In general, you could draw a dotted line here and you could separate the iodine from the calcium. If that was your only goal, you could take the 80 and the 140, you could plot them in a space like this, and you could actually do some segmentation in that space where you look at the characteristics of the given voxels based on how they're performing in the 80 and the 140 acquisitions, or in general, what we call a low and a high energy acquisition. But we're gonna talk specifically today about actual dual energy CT. We wanna get even a little bit more quantitative than this. If we first talk about 
the actual polyenergetic acquisition. So imagine I had a 100 kVp spectrum. So the energy spectrum would look something like this. This is the 100 kVp energy spectrum here. And then at every energy, you can think about it as we go to each given energy, and then for whatever material we're interested in, you look at basically the multiplication of the fraction of the X-ray spectrum, which is at that given energy, and you multiply it by the value of the attenuation coefficient at that given energy. And you keep doing that for every given energy, and then we can add them all up. Our image in a standard CT image actually has weighted measurements from many given X-ray energies all the way from the KVP, which is equal to the maximum KEV of a given spectra, and then all the way down to the lower energy, depending on the type of filtration you have, and depending on the X-rays making it through the body, that lower range may be around 40 KEV. In general, you can look at the axial images of that hand phantom that I was talking about. So you see the fingers, you see the little bones in the fingers, and you see the two objects that are being held up there. And again, at the 140 kVp, it's difficult to distinguish those two objects, namely the iodine and the calcium rods. But when you get down to 80 kVp, then it becomes easier to distinguish those rods. So again, in this image, the one on the right is the iodine rod and the one on the left is the calcium rod. I'm gonna show you this same phantom in some other, what we call decompositions in just a few minutes. So just to get yourself familiar with this phantom and the fact that as we go to lower energies, everything has a higher attenuation coefficient. So everything is brighter in the image, but the iodine is preferentially getting brighter at a higher rate. Attenuation in X-ray imaging, we can actually break that attenuation down into two terms. One of those terms that we call the mass attenuation coefficient, and then the other term we call the density. So the mass attenuation coefficient is the one that actually is going to be dependent on the energy. Density is the traditional definition that you're familiar with, just the mass per given volume. So the mass per given volume of that given material isn't changing, but the actual attenuation characteristics are changing based on the energy. Put that little E there, it just means that we want to keep track of the values as a function of energy because they are dependent on the energy. And there's no E here, so this means it's what's called a scalar. This is just one given number. Whereas these values are what we call a vector, where they have a value for each of the energies in our X-ray spectrum. Remember, the two characteristic interactions which occur in the diagnostic range, it's photoelectric and it's Compton interactions. And so all of your attenuation actually occurs due to photoelectric and Compton interactions. We also have a video on those interactions as well as a video on coherent scattering, which happens at lower energies and isn't a big concern in these diagnostic CT energies. So for our purpose, we're just gonna talk about photoelectric and Compton interactions. So there's only two mechanisms, right? And each of these mechanisms will have some energy dependence. If you remember from grade school, you could have equations like this, where you could have A times a variable X plus B times a variable Y, that equals C. You could have another one where it's D times that variable X and E, times a variable y, and that equals f. A takeaway here is that we could solve this for x, and then we could solve this for y, because we have two equations and two unknowns. So that's the same thing we can do here in our imaging if we have two acquisitions, a low energy acquisition and a high energy acquisition, we can solve for our two given interactions, namely photoelectric and Compton. So we could make images of the photoelectric term and of the Compton term. Physicists, you might really find that cool. You wanna see an image of the photoelectric interactions and the Compton interactions in a patient. If you're a doctor, a patient, or a technologist, you probably care more about what type of materials are in the patient. 
not what type of interactions are happening in the patient. So some of the vendors, GE included, we actually typically like to talk about it in terms of materials. So instead of saying photoelectric and Compton and trying to split up everything into photoelectric and Compton images, we try and split everything up into images of a couple different materials. We call those materials basis pairs. So those two given materials, we're gonna try and split everything up into a water basis and a iodine basis. You can obviously choose other options, but we've chosen water and iodine. So remember the attenuation for water looks something like this. So as a function of energy, the attenuation for water looks something like this. The attenuation for iodine looks something like this here. Any other given material, calcium is an example of another given material in the body. You can actually take a weighted sum of the water curve and add that up to the iodine curve. And we can generate another curve, which actually lies right on top of the calcium curve. And that we're calling our calcium approximation. One little problem here, there's a dip right here. This is what we call the K edge and the absorption for iodine. But luckily for us, most of the X-rays actually coming through are actually going to be above that K edge. So we can do well by just worrying about the X-rays that are out here above the K edge of iodine. You could decompose the image with the two equations and two unknowns. We could decompose into photoelectric and Compton, or we can decompose into an iodine and a water basis. So here's sample images of that same phantom decomposed into an iodine and a water basis. So when we say water iodine and iodine water, those are our base pairs. And that actually means the second one in the list is actually really gonna be suppressed. The image here where we have a water suppress iodine image. Remember, this was the calcium rod and this was the iodine rod. So because the iodine has been suppressed, its value is relatively lower in this case. And then if you go to that same region here, you can see that the iodine is going to be relatively higher here. These are plastic rods, which are not just pure elemental iodine. In general, you can see the behavior of iodine being very bright in this iodine image where water is suppressed. And you can see iodine being darker in this image here, which is water with the iodine suppressed. See that that calcium insert is actually occurring in both, but it actually looks a little bit brighter here in this water iodine suppressed image. If you look in the like approximation of the soft tissue, which is actually just plastic, you can see that that is more water-like, so it's brighter in the water image. Finally, if you look at the bones, the bone actually has contribution in both the water basis image and the iodine basis image. We talked about the polyenergetic beam. We talked about how all of the energies in our spectrum actually contribute. And what we're measuring is actually the sum of these energies. It'd be nice if you could actually have something called a monoenergetic image. So we could generate an image which corresponds to actually just one energy. One way that you can do that is actually go to a synchrotron where you can make x-rays which occur in just one given energy. Synchrotrons can be very large in size and very expensive. So it's not gonna be a general scenario where we would wanna do that for actual medical imaging, maybe to actually use what we have on hand, which is the ability to do that low energy and that high energy image. You could take that low energy and that high energy image and you could generate a virtual mono image directly. You could also take that photoelectric image and that Compton image, you could generate a virtual directly, or you could take a couple given materials. Again, we were talking about iodine and water, but any given materials that you're using, you could use those to make the virtual mono image. So for the case of iodine and water, like we talked about, there's this mass attenuation coefficient that depends on energy. So if you pick one given energy value and you say, how much mass attenuation coefficient due to iodine? and then we multiply that by the density of iodine, 
Likewise, how much for water? Again, the density and the mass attenuation coefficient. So remember, we split everything up into just these two bases. So all of our attenuation should be accounted for if we add these two up. So that will give us the virtual monoenergetic image. Similar behavior to what we saw for the KVPs, but now we're looking at effectively just one given energy. So we'll have talks later where we talk about beam hardening and how this actually helps with respect to beam hardening. You can see here, especially for that iodine rod, you know, if you looked at the iodine values in the attenuation that we're expecting, they are going up significantly. So that's why the iodine rod is getting significantly more bright in these KEV images. So in general, the KEV images have interesting properties that you can trade off and use the lower KEV images to enhance that contrast, just like we talked about enhancing contrast by going to low KVP imaging. From that iodine and water basis image, you can actually generate any other set of basis images you want as well, as long as you have the values from the NIST website, and GE provides you those for a lot of given materials that are actually clinically relevant in the body. So you have the ability to make material decomposed images like we showed you. You have the ability to make virtual mono images like we talked about. And then there's one additional possibility that can actually give you some more utility clinically is what we call a virtual unenhanced image, or it's also called a virtual non-contrast image. We talked about before when we were looking at calcium versus iodine, and we made the plot of the two given energy values, and then the iodine values were all kind of along a line in there. You can use that kind of information to estimate where the iodine values are within the image. And then you can replace the iodine values with blood. So in this scenario, we call this a virtual unenhanced image. And again, this rod that did contain iodine was now replaced with pseudo blood. The idea here is that if you have an acquisition and you'd like to look at an approximation of what it looks like before the iodine was injected, you can prescribe one of these virtual unenhanced images. High level of all the characteristics for dual energy imaging. We haven't talked about the different ways that you actually are gonna do these acquisitions on the system. Let me know in the comments below if that's something you're really interested in. Do you understand why the house unit values change at low KVP imaging? Check out our video on low KVP imaging and explicitly why the contrast values change for low KVP imaging and why it's very good to use low KVPs for certain tasks such as iodine and bone imaging.